I'm Chris Lee of Southeastern 14, joined by Blaine Gilmer and Blake Lovell. We are getting into previewing SEC teams for the coming season. Perfect place to start. The defending national champions, the Georgia Bulldogs. Um, Incredible year for Georgia. Incredible NFL draft. 15 guys going to the draft. And yet here this team is. Basically, preseason expectation is they're going back to the playoff. That's crazy. Yeah, it is. It is uh, somewhat crazy that you know it's it, they can reload that quickly. But if you listen to the tone and tenor of Kirby Smart at SEC Media Days, he's already really playing up the disrespect factor a lot. <laughs> basically, because you know Georgia wins the national championship, and here you got Saban on stage saying you know, literally at SEC Media Day saying, well, you know, we lost a couple corners late. We lost some receivers late. And it was just tough down the stretch. And, of course, the Alabama faithful have ran with that as well. And then their quarterback gets no respect. He's like He was like Rodney Dangerfield up there at SEC Media Day. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, no respect. So we'll see what uh, what how Kirby Smart delves into that psychologically with his team this year. No one gets yeah. respect in the SEC, Chris. I mean, I think <laughs> no, we, we, we've, we've talked about We've learned about, that in our comment section over we, the years. We have learned that. Uh, I think in probably all of our, our schedule previews we've done, um, we talk about that. But, I mean, again, we all know, like you said, Blaine, you talk about, I mean, how many guys are head to the NFL. I mean, they're already there, and you kind of look at this team, and it's Georgia. You know, if this is somebody else, we, we know Alabama, very similar situation, but it's just you, you just reload with a lot of talented guys. And I think that will be the thing is, you know, it's going to be a different player in some of these positions. And it's just what is the is there a huge adjustment from a talent standpoint? You know, some positions may be more than others, but look, we still look at this team. And as we said, Chris, when we did our schedule preview for Georgia, this is a team is going to be favored to win every game on their schedule. And when you look at it that way, you know, I just think it's, it's still a situation where they're, they're the King right now and everybody's still coming for them based on how they, you know, won the national championship last year. So well, Blake last year, we, we were doing ratings of the best 14 defenders in the league every week. And I'd, I'd watch games. I'd look at box scores and I'd try to, con- and Georgia was just freaking impossible. Because first of all, I mean, defensively, you don't just go by the stats, but they do mean something. If somebody's got an absurd sack total or picked off eight passes, then obviously that's not meaningless. But they had so many guys. Like everybody's snap count was low. So none of these guys were racking up huge numbers to where like another fan base could come at you and go, well, this guy's done this and this guy from X school has got three times the tackles and twice the sacks. I'm like, well, how do you even begin to quantify what they're doing? A, because they're so stinking deep everywhere. And, and B, because like you don't rack up stats when every series is a three and out. I just and, and then the draft, right? Um, Trayvon Walker was not considered their best defender. I don't think by anybody all year. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, there were you heard Jordan Davis, you heard a lot of guys. And then he goes number one in the draft. I mean, it, it just was it's crazy. And and by the way, Despite all those draft picks, a lot of these kids that were on the field a lot last year are back. Yeah, for sure. And you talked about Trayvon Walker. I thought it would be a good point to point out this is a young man that had six sacks last year and goes number one overall. He wasn't a double-digit sack guy. This wasn't somebody – it was just freak athleticism, and it's something that that Georgia had across the board – and here's the crazy thing, Chris. People may, you know, just go crazy in the comment section when I say this, but I'm telling you that this Georgia defense, top to bottom, may be more talented than the Georgia defense they had last year. They just won't be as experienced. But you talk about Smile Munden, Xavier Sorry, Jamon Dumas Johnson at that linebacker core that's going to be taking the place of Quay Walker, Chan Tendo, and Kobe Dean. They were more highly recruited than those three that just wow. that just went in the NFL draft. Yeah, I was gonna say, Blaine. I think Dumas Johnson probably the he's that next name, right? Like you talk about guys on that defense. I think he's he's clearly that next get name we're probably gonna be talking about a lot this year. Would be would be my guess, just based on again every all the expectations heading into this season. Well, yeah. and another thing that, that caught my mind, Blaine, 
there's all this talk now that Jalen Carter was best player on last year's team or, 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 or however it's been phrased. I'm like, and that, that's, again, that's what made it so tough. It's hard to know when you've got all these studs all over the place, who's the guy that's the, the alpha dog. And because when, when you're along for the ride with the rest of that bunch, everybody benefits. Oh, yeah. If Jalen Carter could have came out for the draft if he was eligible, Georgia would have had six first-round draft picks yeah. last year. Jalen Carter, uh, you know, Lord willing, stays healthy. He will be a top-five draft pick this upcoming year. That's how good Jalen Carter is and how much he's loved by uh, NFL scouts and, and draft prognosticators and all that kind of stuff out there this year. He's going to anchor that that up front, and he's a guy that not only can, can – rush the passer like he absolutely can can just manhandle interior linemen he's a mismatch but he's he's great against the run as well and that's george's calling card they literally suffocate your running game force you into uh long passing down and obvious passing down situations and then the the pressure that comes from all angles is uh is overwhelming at times yeah i mean it's like we said guys i mean you, you look at their defense i it's like what else do we say at this point like we, we just you know what to expect and it's funny chris because we kind of said that when we talked about you know schedules with with alabama and georgia and we're just like you you understand what you're getting now like there's not a whole lot of questions in terms of um you know what you're getting from from these kind of teams now especially one that's coming off winning a national championship even though like we said this is a team that's gonna have to replace some guys uh but you know, Blaine just mentioned it. You got a lot of guys coming in <laughs> recruiting wise, you, you know where they stand and you know that there's a lot of guys going to come in that are going to make a huge impact right away. Um, and yeah, you just don't have a lot of questions and on the, especially on the defensive side, right? I mean, it's yeah. again, you, you know what you're getting Kirby smart defense, but finally Blaine, I also think this is going to be the year, the stats, man, uh, come on. It, can, can we give this guy, some credit. They go out and win the national championship last year. We know that was one of the big storylines coming to the year. Everybody's just back and forth and you just never knew what was going to happen. You know, we were laughing about the, the Justin Fields stuff earlier. Like it's just, but what is, you know, Setson goes out and wins the national championship. And now, you know, you kind of look at what he's got coming into the season. I mean, come on, can, can we, can we give the guy some love at this point, please? <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. I think uh, one odd thing is you look at the if you did a blind stat comparison and put up, you know, quarterback A, B and C and you had these stats yeah. out there, people would be shocked that when you turned those cards over, one is yeah. Will Levis, one is Hendon Hooker and one is Stetson Bennett and Stetson Bennett's numbers were as good, if not better than both of those guys. And both of those guys are being heralded as potential first round draft picks next year. Stetson Bennett was a finish efficient. That's a minute just doesn't fit the mold of what most people's uh, ideal SEC national championship winning quarterback is. And by the way, people did see there's an iconic screen grab at the celebration after the national championship. He's taller than Bryce Young, and Bryce Young won the Heisman. So, <laughs> wow. Well, here's there, there were two things that stuck out about him to me a year ago. One is the efficiency. You mentioned it. I think he was third in the country in pass efficiency. And number two, to me, quarterbacks, I, I don't just, like I said, when I'm rating people, it's not just, okay, what are the numbers you put on paper? It's when do you do it and how do you handle situations? When he had that turnover in the second half and you're thinking, okay, here's a spot where Alabama takes control. He, he didn't hang his head. He came back and played about as well as he could and finished that off. And to me, th that was the spot where the weight of the world was on him, right? Because you had all this, he shouldn't be the quarterback. You had all this they, – they can't get past Alabama. And you know right then and there, if that game goes the other way, who the GOAT is and you know what the storylines are, he stood above all that and got them to the finish line. And, and I'm not saying he didn't have my respect before then, but, buddy, when he did that, I looked at him in a whole different light. Absolutely. I looked at him in a whole different light when he went on Good Morning America the, the next morning after clearly – clearly having no sleep whatsoever and i mean was an absolute champ in there with uh, yeah. uh michael strahan in the crew but you're absolutely right um i think you got to give a lot of credit to two things as well you got to give a lot of credit to kirby smart's stubbornness because yeah. he he at that point what it, it would have been easy for somebody to say okay well i got jt daniels here on the bench who 
uh, you know, has shown that he can do some some crazy things. It's just – it may not be – you know, Stetson may just may not be able to get over the hump against Alabama, but he went 180 degrees the other way and and got on the headset, as we learned in SEC Media Days, and told Todd Munkin, go after him. Go after him. Sling it to these next – and three straight passing plays just right down the field uh, mm-hmm. that next drive. That That's impressive. Yeah, I mean, we were. I guess we talked about earlier too about Kirby Smart's comments um, as well. You know, just keep doubting them. They're, they're everybody on Georgia, we're just doubting all these guys coming off the national championship. Um, but but he's right. I mean, and there is no like at this point, you can't doubt what Stetson Bennett has accomplished. And I think that's you know that's what we know, right, Blaine? We we know now with the offense, we know with him leading the way. Now you know it will be kind of a situation where. You kind of look at this offense, you've got, you know, seven returning starters here. And as you've kind of got in our, our notes here, Blaine, you could kind of argue that uh, it could be eight when you look at uh, Warren Erickson and stuff, kind of looking on the, the offensive line. But, I mean, again, this is still a group that you you look at and, you know, you look at this wide receiver group, certainly the tight end, uh, you know, situation. Uh, there's just – there's so much to like. And we talked about how the defense is going to be the defense. I think now with, with Stetson Bennett leading the way – the offense is kind of the offense too, where you kind of come into the season knowing what to expect. There's not a ton of questions that are going to throw you one way or the other about, you know, can they get over the hump or anything like that? We saw it last year. And now it's just, as we said, kind of on defense, it's, it's plug and replace on some of these other guys. And if they do that and the transition is easy enough, I don't have a ton of doubts about their offense either. So. Well, here's something I was looking up while you guys were speaking. And that was his, a tight end ever won the Heisman. Uh, it, it's happened twice. Both were before 1950, but th- that leads into kind of what I think of Brock Bowers. That that kid yeah. was a stud a year ago. I mean, he's yeah. taken into rounds. He's leading them, I think, in receiving. Again, I don't know that anybody on this offense is going to rack up numbers to do that because that, that tight end room, it's well documented, is loaded. But to me, you don't often hear like a, a tight end of the, the guy that makes an offense go. But Blaine, is that is that fair to say? Like, if you could put that label on anybody, he's the guy that like I'm I'm petrified of if I'm game planning them. Oh yeah, you you cannot. I mean, you can't match up with with Brock Bowers. He has elite speed, uh, where he is faster than most defensive backs. Um, if he let's put it this way, Brock Bowers and Kirk Herbstreet, uh, who you know knows a little bit about football, he said this on College Game Day. He said if Brock Bowers were to be able to come out right now after as a freshman, he would be a starting tight end yep. in the NFL the next year. That's the kind of talent that you have in Brock Bowers. So you know, then you add okay, Darnell Washington is behind him, who's basically LeBron James on grass. He's six foot, six foot seven, six foot eight, two hundred and sixty pounds, and could just glide. And then now you have a healthy Eric Gilbert comes in. So to your point, I think there is there are so many guys there that I don't know if the the stats would ever be gaudy enough for somebody to win, but uh, at, from from Georgia. But that tight end position is absolutely what makes this Georgia offense go because Georgia can line up in thirteen. Heck, they could yeah. line up in 14 personnel, four tight ends, put Oscar Delp out there, and they would be a mismatch for virtually everyone uh, lining up across from them. Yeah. Um, I don't – again, I don't have a lot of questions about the the passing game. I, mean, I, I think running back, you know, you know who you're replacing. I think that's something that people will talk about. But it's funny. I, so, someone said this. I don't remember. It was not long ago, but they're just like, it's Georgia, right? Like you just expect their running backs to come out and, <laughs> and run yeah, for a thousand yeah. yards. And, you know, it, that's what they said. They're like, it's Georgia. Their defense will shut people out. They'll run the ball. You know, they'll beat teams by three touchdowns or something. And their running backs will just rack up yards. And and I think that's a situation where when you are replacing Zamir White, you know, James Cook, those guys, I, I would expect that to Blaine. I mean, you know, I, I'm curious to see what you think about that, this, this group of running backs. But I just – it's the same thing. Like I hate to repeat myself, but it's like Georgia has established, as we know, kind of, you just expect the next guy in line to come up and with the way they're going to play on offense. And again, I think with the way the game script's going to go, where they're going to be beating teams, a lot of teams, you know, probably by double digits, those guys are going to get opportunities. And I think that's just going to keep, you know, the, the more experience and that just keeps getting them better. I think in that situation. So. Yeah, Kenny McIntosh is a guy that's an unbelievable multifaceted running back for Georgia. I mean, he can catch the ball out of the backfield very, very well. And when it comes, 
you know, down to it. He's just a guy who had to bide his time behind some pretty good running backs. You had James Cook go in the second round. You had Zamir White go in the fourth round. So, and in fact, people are even projecting Kenny McIntosh to possibly be a second round pick himself before even being a full time starter for Georgia. And then, of then of course, uh, Kendall Milton is right behind him as well. And Kendall Milton is a guy that has been long you know, storied uh, that everybody says, oh, Kendall Milton's going to break out. He's just been injured. He's He's been fighting injuries. So if he can stay healthy, quite a one-two punch, even still just experience that is the only thing lacking with those two. You know, I talked about young kids on this offense that made plays for them a year ago. And, and this guy I don't think was highly recruited at all. But Lad McConkey made, it, made a pretty big splash. And I know they got tight ends, mouths to feed, but he's a guy to me that, He's a problem, too, if you're trying to defend that kid. Yeah, Lad, Lad McConkey, A.D. Mitchell, and Brock Bowers, all three freshmen last year, they they were the top three in receptions for Georgia. Uh, Lad McConkey, you're absolutely right. He's from the Chatsworth uh, area, um, uh, Tennessee, could have probably had him. Uh, they never, they never offered. He had a lot of Tennessee orange going in his blood, and Kirby Smarts and and the company uh, right there. Um, at the end before signing day said we'll take Ladd McConkey and uh, you know he was on his way to playing during the kind of during the COVID year a little bit as a as a true freshman but um, kind of some of that stuff hampered him and as a redshirt freshman he breaks out and has a great year uh, for Georgia he's a guy that people you know like to view him because of the stereotypes you know like <laughs> sneaky fast is what Stetson Bennett said you know uh, a, a white guy out at receiver over there but when he comes it comes to it. He can play outside. He can play inside. He is a talented guy, uh, Lad McConkey for Georgia. Let me ask you guys this. We talked about all this good stuff, right? Um, if you had to pick one, like what, what's the biggest question that we would have for Georgia going into the season? Like we said, it, we're, we'll go through the kind of projected record, all that in a second, but again, it's going to be a team that's going to be favored in every game they play in. Um, going to have a chance to get back to college football playoff, win another national championship. But like, if we had to define one question, like, what's the biggest thing, Blaine? Let me. I'll start with you. What's the biggest thing that could derail all of that? Like, what's the? What do you think's the one? And besides obvious injuries, we we know that. But is there anything that you just look at and you're just like, you know, I still I'm kind of in wait and see on that. And then once that's a little more defined, then hey, I'm, I'm pretty much all in at that point. So. I would say it's if the, that talent that has been there kind of in reserve on Georgia's defense maybe doesn't catch up uh, in, in terms of learning scheme and, and how to react right. in real-time situations. Because you can have all these practice reps, but until you're the guy in the game, that's a wholly – whole different story so i think you know if it takes a little time for them to adjust to being the guy not one of the guys uh at the defensive line interior defensive line at that linebacking core i think that could be maybe something because it it would force georgia to play a different style than they want to even though we think the offense is going to be really really good georgia's a lot better when they're not having to you know play from behind or play a really, really tight game uh, there at the end. So I think that could be be it is how long does it take some of those uh, key replacements on defense to come in, come into their own. Blaine, I'm glad you answered that because if you hadn't answered that, I would have been left with a, a blank stare on my face. Chris but, is uh, yeah, that, that would have been great <laughs> podcasting, but I, I did, that get, did give me time to think. And, and I was going through, I've got a list in front of me, of various people's all SEC teams, and I there's like 150 players on there. One thing that I did notice, I didn't see a kick or a punter on there for Georgia. Um, mm. and not not implying that they're bad, but let's say they they're locking horns with Alabama, or they're in a, a close game with with Auburn or somebody or Florida, where maybe it's not expected because that happens to everybody most seasons. Is is it a missed field goal, a blocked punt? I'm not I'm not suggesting again that they're bad in that, but you're looking everywhere they're star-studded. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I want to mention this, and we can touch on it later. For their offensive linemen, I've seen picked on various all-SEC teams, even though they're <laughs> replacing a couple of starters. That tells yeah. you how strong and deep yeah. they are. So when, when you're looking for a weakness, it's not, okay, they're weak here. It's like, oh, well, by omission, you know, they got all-stars across the field, and, and that's maybe the one place they don't. Yeah, and – 
you know, when it comes to the the, the specialist, I'm a little surprised. Uh, I didn't even look. I'm surprised Jack Pod Lesney did not end yeah. up on some of those because yeah. Jack Pod Lesney is a very good uh, place kicker. Now Georgia does replace Jake Camarda at punter, yeah. um, who Jake Camarda was a weapon. I mean, he he, he seventy yard punts. I mean, this guy was booming them. So, uh, but it, it, as long as Todd Hartley is, is there. Um, who he's the tight end coach, but he he directly works with uh, those those kickers some too. Um, I think Georgia's specialist will, will be be okay. And then the the offensive line, like you pointed out, and and like Blake said earlier, Warren Erickson is a guy who's actually getting preseason All American love for some people, and he may not even start for Georgia <laughs> at right at right guard. So you got Broderick Jones at left tackle, Warren McClendon, who is a all-American caliber guy, three-year starter at right tackle, and then Cedric Von Prahn. This is not hyperbole when I say this. He may go down as the best center Georgia's ever had, and mm-hmm. they've had some good ones in Ben Jones and David Andrews. So um, I think, I think like you said, yeah, they've got a, the, the guards, the left and right guard, they've got to figure out. they got to figure out a new punter. But if uh, if two of your two of your five offensive linemen and uh, a punter are your biggest concerns going into the year, I think uh, Georgia's, Georgia's got a lot to look forward to in 2022. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And and look, if you if you're someone in the SEC and you're trying to win, and you don't look at Georgia or Alabama or these other teams and realize that everything starts at the lines, and just you see the depth, like we just talked about, with kind of what you have there, that's your come on. Like you just, my goodness, like you look at what, especially Georgia. Like we said, we talked about last year, and and obviously what they could be this year. Um, you just look at the the lines and just where they are on each side, offensive line, defensive defensive line. It's just it's remarkable to see some of the depth um, and it's just, yeah, that is something you just don't have any questions about necessarily um, that, that are going to be those big questions, right? Not the one that you feel like is going to really just hold you back. So yeah. Um, yeah, Chris, I think, I think George is going to be pretty good this year. There's my bold prediction. So. Well, in, in seriousness, it, it takes a lot of thought and a deep dive to say, where could this team get tripped up? And the other place is scheduling. And I know their schedule is not very hard. In fact, it's probably the easiest in the yeah. SEC, helped by the fact that Georgia does not have to play Georgia. But you see crazy stuff happen sometimes in openers. They got a talented Oregon team they play with their former defensive coordinator on the other sideline. Blaine, you live in Georgia. I'm guessing that's been a topic once or twice on talk shows down there. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Dan Lanning very much so viewed and not for the – you know, same amount of time, but very much so in that Nick's, Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, that was kind of the role there. Kirby learning from Nick, the defense. Well, Dan Lanning very much so grew into that defensive coordinator role over time. And by the end of it, Kirby, you know, let him have a lot of autonomy in that, in that defense. Uh, so when that, when that happens, you know, that's a lot of guy you've put a lot of trust in. He helped recruit a lot of those players there that are on Georgia's roster right now. And now he's the uh, going to be on the other sideline. Now he's going to be trying to figure out, you know, okay, where do our, our guys who are carrying the, the the Gatorade cups, where do they stand? Where do special teams line up? Like it's first game for Oregon. So there's a lot, there's a litany of issues that you have to go through when it's the first game uh, as, a, as a head coach. But certainly the familiarity, the chess game between uh, Lanning and Munkin, between Smart and Lanning and, and uh, you know, it's going to be a very much so a talking point and and something like that. But I think it's going to be more of an emotional uh, type thing, maybe just leading into it. And then once toe, you know, meets leather, I feel like uh, that that's kind of all you know, going to fade away other than you're going to see two defenses that look very, very similar schematically. Yeah. And by the way, Blaine has already done, we've done our preview and um, prediction for that Oregon game. We'll put that in the, um, in the descriptions, if you want to click on that, check that out. So if you're watching this, a Georgia fan, and we also did, of course, Chris and I did our, our schedule preview for Georgia. We went through every game and kind of talked about that schedule overall, Chris, which I guess does lead us to kind of what we're going to wrap up with here. And that is, it's crazy. that you think about it, an over under win total at 11, that's, mm-hmm. um that's when you know you're pretty good when that number is uh, not just in double digits, but it's, you know, it's one loss there and, and that's it. So I think, that's where the interesting part is, but of course we have to kind of revert back to the schedule to figure that out. You know, if, if you're looking at the over under win total, what, what do we see is kind of that projection. And I said earlier, they're going to be favored in every game they play in 
when I look at this schedule, I think the Oregon one is definitely the one, even though it is, you know, it's game one, Oregon's going to have some things to figure out. I mean, right guys like that. They're still, if you look at it from a scheduling standpoint, they're still the best team probably overall on Georgia's schedule. And it just happens to be week one, um, week one. And from there, you get you get Tennessee at home. You know, obviously you get Florida in Jacksonville. The road games, as we talked about, Chris, I think they're more than manageable. Um, you're talking about South Carolina, Missouri, Mississippi State, South, and Kentucky. South Carolina, Blake, that's that's the one I, I think know. you got to watch out for. I, uh, I think the, the thing I th- I know the thing I'm I'm thinking on that is this, Blaine, and this is why I th- we we probably discussed this too, Chris, in the schedule preview, but. My thinking is, let's say Georgia comes out and just really takes care of business against Oregon and, you know, looks great and and everything, you know, they're they're really just clicking. Like those questions we talked about, like, boy, these guys are going to step in. They're going to be great. Um, Yeah, it's their first road game, early kickoff, those kind of things. But and we look, we're we're high on South Carolina. Chris and I talked about this like we think it's it's we saw what they did last year. Right. And I think they're just going to keep getting better. But. Maybe I, I think you're right. Like that is probably if you look down the rest of the schedule, I think depending on where Kentucky is, maybe at that point, if, if Tennessee is, you know, all of a sudden their offense is just unstoppable. That game gets more interesting. I think on November 5th, probably more interesting if it's in Knoxville, but it's not. Um, those are the kind of things that I probably I'm looking at, but I, I'm not going to deny the South Carolina one could be depending on how this first game goes to me is probably a much better judge of where things are once they get to that South Carolina game. Well, I think, too, it has to do with the week before for South Carolina. If South Carolina goes on the road to Arkansas, okay, right. and they, by some ap- happen chance, Spencer Rattler plays out of his mind and they end up beating Arkansas and come back home to Columbia with that kind of yeah. confidence, then I think Georgia's really – because because we all know that williams Bryce Stadium is electric. It, when, when South Carolina's good, when they're believing – that stadium is mm-hmm. as loud as any in the in the country. I mean, it is a loud place to play. They play the sandstorm craziness, all that kind of stuff. So uh, that's that's the only thing I think can get you. Crazy things have happened in that Georgia South Carolina yep. uh, game over the years, um, but it's going to be interesting. And and hey, they got Shane Beamer doing TikToks and all kinds of stuff. So there's excitement <laughs> for South Carolina's program. We right? know they're going to be well coached, and and that's why. Yeah, you're right. Like that's one that you're. Definitely going to have to prepare for. I think, like you said, let's say they go win in Arkansas. I think if, if it goes the other way where it's like, man, you go in and you just play a battle with Arkansas and let's say you lose by a field goal or something, great game. And it's like, man, you got to turn right around and get up for a, a Georgia team that may have already beaten, you know, like we said, Oregon by a touchdown or two and those kind of things. So we'll see. But, but I think as we talked about over under 11 for the number, not surprising at all because – it's just trying to find or like, that's what we're doing now. Like we're trying to find a game on their schedule somewhere. We're like, uh Oh, but I don't think there's a lot of those on there. Chris, as we talked about, we talked well, about Phil Steele and what was it? 58. I think was their strength of schedule overall. I think it might've been 61, but, but it was the lowest. What, of, yeah. Yeah. Well, here's something I want to ask you guys both. Um, stylistically, is there, is there a team on here that can give them trouble? Like Tennessee is the one that comes to mind because of tempo, because of a running quarterback, uh, you know, those guys are nightmares. I mean, Florida, the, the, the game is in Jacksonville. I know that's not a style issue. Auburn's a rivalry game. Like, what, what's the one that you look at? And it might not be the, the best team on the schedule, but is there a game that stylistically gives you a little bit of pause uh, as you look at their slate? Blaine, quickly, I'm going to jump in here. I would say Tennessee, and it's something yeah. you said earlier about – you don't feel like this is a Georgia team that's going to want to get in those games where let's say you're playing from behind necessarily, or you're having to play in those shootout type games. Um, I would say Tennessee just because, and look, I, I admit this as someone who thinks Tennessee is, we've talked about it over the years, right? With yeah. Tennessee, there's a lot of hype going into the season and sometimes it's just not, it doesn't work out. I'm, I'm buying in this season. I think they're going to be really good. So I think that's probably the one I would look at. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that would be it. The, the only the only other one is that that South Carolina team, but it depends, like I said, a lot what happens on week two because uh, with Arkansas, they're going to get they, – that's going to be a physical contest against Arkansas, so they may be beat up going into that Georgia game. Yep. Well, the, the over-under 11 is an interesting number because it leaves you two choices. <laughs> You're saying they're either going 10 or 2 or worse or, or 12 and 0. 
Uh, and, and frankly, I, I, if I've got to pick a, one of the two, and I'll be surprised if either of you disagree with me on this, I think it's more likely that that number to the right of the dash heading into that week in Atlanta, with, which you know they would be playing in at that point, is more likely to be a zero than it is a two or three or a four or whatever. Are we all agreed I, on that? I agree. I would yeah. go over. Yeah. Yeah. So there we are. Georgia and Bama and Atlanta. I think so. I think so. Unless Arkansas is really good. <laughs> yeah. There you go, Arkansas good. fans. Blaine, Blaine doing his contractual obligations, getting in the That's Arkansas right. mention here to really get you, you fired up. So <laughs> All right, any any parting thoughts on the Bulldogs before we end this? They'll be good. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a little uh, prediction and say Stetson Bennett goes over three thousand yards for Georgia this year. So I think it's gonna be a big year for uh, offensively for Georgia. Got a lot of weapons to work with, so I I wouldn't be surprised at all by that. So I, I will buy. All right, gentlemen, it's been fun. We've got thirteen more of these to go as we preview all fourteen SEC teams. Thank you for watching. Hit that subscribe button. We'll be back with another one of these very soon.